Hi, Jack. Say, I thought you promised to lift the curtain on the features of our new overhead valve six-cylinder engine. Yet here I am, still in the dark. Oh, and my boy, I know you're raring to go, but there's no need to bite your nails. After all, Pete just got back yesterday from her class on that new engine at the trading center. Maybe he needs a little more time. Hey, thanks for the alibi, Tech, but I'm all ready right now. The sooner I tell Owen all I learned about the new engine, the sooner he'll be able to tune it up properly. And you can't blame Owen for being so interested. Actually, every guy that lifts the hood on one of our new six-cylinder cars is going to be mighty curious. We've got a real first in passenger car engine design. Inclining the engine 30 degrees to the right from vertical, for instance, does more than give the car a low hood line. It gives the car a lower center of gravity and provides space for the new manifolding system. The water pump is mounted on the left side of the engine instead of on the front. Now, this reduces the overall length of the engine. I see, Pete. And does it pack a lot of extra power? She sure does. 145 horses rated at 4,000 RPM. Sounds great, Tech. Oh, it is great, all right, Owen. Listen to this. Maximum torque is 215 foot-pounds at 2,800 RPM. Now, that's a terrific amount of output. Piston displacement is 225 cubic inches. There's a 3.4-inch bore and a 4.125-inch stroke. But now, more important than the power story is the wonderful economy this new six will deliver, and on regular gasoline. That's right, Pete. So the more we know about what's new and how to keep this engine tuned up, the better it's going to perform for the owner. Very true, Tech. But Owen will find tune-up procedures no problem. The engineers really kept us service technicians in mind. Everything's a lot easier to get at. As an example, on the right side, you'll find the spark plugs, the oil filter, the oil pump, distributor, coil, and the fuel pump. On the left side, you'll find the generator, carburetor, air cleaner, manifolds, and the starter. The oil filler cap is in the top of the cylinder head cover. The engine oil dipstick is at the left of the engine, just behind the generator. Now that's accessibility with a capital A. I can see that everything's a lot handier. But uh, what's the tune-up story on this new engine? Relax, friend. Locations differ, but basic tune-up procedures are still pretty much the same. Yeah, Tech's absolutely right. But before we go into the tune-up story... I'd like to describe the new features more in detail. This will help you understand the entire engine design better and how easily service can be handled. The cylinder head, for instance, is made of chrome alloy cast iron. It has wedge-shaped combustion chambers, about the same type as those on the eight-cylinder engines. Compression ratio is 8.5 to 1. 8.5, huh? Not bad. As a matter of fact, Owen, the compression ratio plus regular fuel are important factors in the economical performance of this engine. Oh, you're so right, Tech. Now, here's another feature. The cylinder head bolts are set up so there's four around each cylinder. Now, this contributes to even compression of the head gasket and a tight seal all the way around. But something really spectacular is the distinctive aluminum intake manifold design. It reminds you of the ram induction system available on V8s. The six branches, one for each cylinder intake port, distribute fuel evenly to all cylinders. The exhaust manifold also has separate branches, one for each cylinder exhaust port. This manifold system represents a big advance in engine breathing. As a further aid to breathing, the exhaust pipe flange is located in the center of the manifold. Exhaust gases are therefore expelled more efficiently. The automatic choke well is cast into the exhaust manifold. The heat control valve, mounted on the front side of the manifold, has its shaft parallel to the engine center line. Now, this makes it much easier to service. Wow, that sure is a big change in manifolding. Mm, that it is, Owen. Now, cast your eye at the overhead valve setup. Valves are in line, but are inclined slightly to improve the flow path for the incoming mixture. Valve stem guides are integral in the head. Each valve has one spring. Both intake and exhaust valves have umbrella-type seals to keep oil out of the cylinders. Four bead locks permit easy rotation of exhaust valves to provide better cooling and seating. Intake valves use two bead locks. Mechanical tappets, eh? Right. 
and the tubular push rods have hardened steel ends. The stamped steel rocker arms are channel for lubrication. A hardened steel bushing welded into the arm acts as a bearing on the shaft. The rocker arm shaft, mounted on pedestals cast in the cylinder head, is retained by seven bolts and stamped steel retainer caps. Notice that the large retainer is located in the center. The rear bolt is the longest one and goes through the oil passage leading to the rocker shaft. Hardened steel spacers are used between the rocker arms. The push rods contact the arms at an angle, which tends to force the arms against the spacers. So, no springs are needed to hold the arms in alignment. Intake valve lash should be set at 10 thousandths. Exhaust lash at 20 thousandths with the engine at normal operating temperature. Self-locking screws are used in the rocker arms to adjust valve clearance. 10 and 20. Okay, I'll keep it in mind. Good. Now, here's something that's new to us. Intake valve face and seat angles are 45 degrees, just like our other engines. But exhaust valve face angle is 47 degrees. Exhaust valve seat angle is 45. The interference angle of 2 degrees on exhaust valves provides a better gas seal. It also minimizes carbon deposit formation on the valve face. Sounds like a smart idea. Now, uh, let me ask this question. Haven't we seen this tube and spark plug set up before? You've seen one a lot like it, Owen, but these tubes are shorter. They protect the plug and serve as the gasket. Yeah, and the plugs are different, too. They're an AG42 non-resistor type. You still gap them at 35 thousandths, though, and tighten them to 30 foot-pounds. Notice the rubber seal at the top of the tube. It seals the tube to the cylinder head. A combination spark plug cap and sleeve also help seal out water and dirt. The high-tension cables are the resistance core type, the same as we have been using. Pistons are aluminum, cam ground, slipper type, with a cast-in steel insert across the pin bosses. The piston ring lineup consists of a chrome-plated top ring, a tin-plated second ring, and a three-piece steel oil ring. Main and connecting rod bearings are steel-backed babbitt with extra-large bearing surfaces. A quiet 50-link chain drives the hardened cast-iron camshaft. Valves are properly timed when marks on the sprockets are on a straight line between sprocket center lines. What is correct ignition timing on this new engine? Well, time it at two and one-half degrees before top center, Owen. There's a mark on the vibration damper. Four marks, five degrees apart, are on the chain case cover. When you set timing, remember to disconnect the vacuum advance line at the distributor and plug the line. Okay, Pete. I hate to sound like a disc jockey, fellas, but uh, well, it's time to turn the record over. There's more about the new engine on the other side. The oil pump, externally mounted on this new engine, has an aluminum die-cast body which incorporates the oil filter mounting pad. It's a rotor-type pump and is driven by the same camshaft gear that drives the distributor. The oil filter is a full-flow, replaceable element type. It's easy to get at and service. And here's something else that's new. A deep sump oil pan. The bottom is horizontal and sides are slanted 30 degrees. The oil pump inlet screen is pressed firmly against the bottom of the oil pan when the pan is installed. Now, that's to prevent rattles at that point. Remember that interference fit when you install the pan. The pan must press against the oil screen assembly. Crankcase oil capacity is four quarts plus one additional quart for the filter. Four plus one, okay. Now, the carburetor, as you can see, is a single barrel downdraft ball and ball. It's a new low silhouette design, aluminum and zinc unit. On manual transmission cars, a BBS 2985S carburetor is used. On automatic transmission cars, a BBS 2986S carburetor is used. Both carburetors use a well-type automatic choke that's connected to the choke valve by an inclined rod. Any change in the air cleaner? Nope. It's a dry paper element job, same as before, and is held by a wire bail and stud with a wing nut. Makes it a cinch to service the air cleaner. Good news again. What else is different? Well, the starting motor features an especially quiet follow-through Bendix drive. 
Notice that the starter is mounted high above the oil pan, out of range of road splash. The generator is a 12-volt shunt-wound unit rated at 35 amperes. It's pivot-mounted on the left side and driven in the usual way by a V-type belt from the crankshaft pulley. That distributor is Chrysler Corporation built. Right. It features the aluminum housing and has conventional vacuum and mechanical timing controls. Now, when you remove the cap, you'll notice that it's a single breaker type. A nylon gear on the short shaft meshes with the same camshaft gear that drives the oil pump. Engine lubrication is basically the same as before. Oil is picked up by the pump and forced through the full flow filter element. From there, it goes into the main oil gallery. Drilled passages from the gallery feed the main bearings and camshaft bearings. Passages in the crankshaft carry oil from the main bearing journals to the connecting rod bearings. A hole in each rod bearing matches a drilled hole in the top left shoulder of the rod. Oil sprays from this hole to lubricate cylinder walls and piston pins. A drilled passage from the number four camshaft bearing carries oil to the rocker shaft rear pedestal. From there, oil goes into the hollow rocker shaft which feeds oil to each rocker arm. Right, and rocker arms, remember, are channeled to lubricate push rod sockets and valve stem tips. Oil returns to the sump past the spark plug sleeves and through holes between the tappet bores. The upper half of the number one main bearing has a chamfer. Now this forms a metered passage for lubricating the timing, chain, and sprockets. You follow all that? Why, sure, Pete. You make it mighty clear. Fine. Now, the cooling system is a semi-series circuit. Most of the coolant flows through the block from front to rear. It returns through the head passages. About 10% of the coolant bleeds directly from the block to the head passages. This provides continuous coolant circulation around exhaust valve ports. Notice that the side-mounted water pump housing is integral with the block. The pump is a centrifugal type and has an aluminum body. The cooling system thermostat is mounted in the cylinder head at the left front side. An aluminum water outlet elbow holds the thermostat in place. Cooling system capacity is 13 quarts, plus an extra quart for the hot water heater. That's U.S. measure. On Canadian cars, it's 10.8 quarts, plus one. Imperial measure. Okay. Looks like engine cooling is well taken care of. Right. And so is crankcase ventilation. Now, this engine has a draft tube ventilating system that discharges vapors underneath the car. In this system, the draft tube attached to the top rear of the cylinder head cover, extends into the airstream below. A flat strip across the front of the tube creates a low pressure area behind the tube. I think I can figure out the rest, Pete. And it looks like it's going to be good protection against sludge. Now, I was wondering, is there anything special to watch on this engine when we get a new car ready for delivery? Well, you might as well test tightness of the rocker shaft and arm assembly bolts they should snug down to 30 foot-pounds torque. Start with the center bolt, then work toward each end alternately. Well, how about the torque on the manifold stud nuts? Oh, I'm glad you mentioned that, Owen. It's extremely important that those stud nuts be tightened cold and to not over 10 foot-pounds. If you get them too tight, expansion and contraction at extremes of operating temperatures may crack the manifold. On the intake to exhaust manifold bolts, Torque should be 200 inch-pounds after the manifolds have been tightened to the head. 10 foot-pounds on the studs, 200 inch-pounds on the bolts. I'll remember both of those torques. Good. Now, during a tune-up, it's always a good idea to measure carburetor float level. Use this gauge. Float level should be 7 30 seconds of an inch. Notice that the float chamber cover gasket is removed when you measure float level. The new float bowl vent opening is tied in with the accelerator pump stroke. The vent improves hot starting by acting like a relief valve for vapors in the bowl. The vent cover is lifted by a pin spring in a groove on the pump plunger shaft. When the pump connector rod is in the center hole, the pin spring should be in the middle groove. So while the bowl cover is off, make sure the pin is properly located. I get the idea, Pete. Now. The choke unloader should be set at 11 64ths of an inch. 
the accelerator pump stroke should be set at 27 30 seconds of an inch with the connector rod in the center hole and the throttle fully closed. How about the other carburetor adjustments? Well, the mixture screw setting should be about one full turn open. So, warm up the engine and set the idle speed. Now, here's another variation in specifications we're going to have to remember. Idle speed is 550 RPM on cars equipped with a manual transmission. On cars with automatic transmission, set engine idle to 500 RPM. Now, can you remember those? Sure. Then I'll smooth out the adjustment with the mixture screw. Now, check me out on some of the specifications we've already talked about. Spark plug gap should be 35 thousandths. That's right. And plug should be tightened to 30 foot-pounds torque. Right. And correct ignition timing, as I recall it, is two and one-half degrees before top center. Yep, two and one-half before. And don't forget to disconnect the vacuum line and plug it so you won't get any advance. Okay. Now, let's see. Intake valve lash should be ten thousandths. Exhaust valve lash is twenty thousandths, both with the engine at normal operating temperature. That's correct, Owen. And always check them hot. Don't forget to use a new cylinder head cover gasket when you finish adjusting the valve lash. Don't want an oil leak, you know. All right, I'll watch it, Tech. Another thing you ought to keep in mind is that point gap should be 17 to 23 thousandths. So try for 20 and you won't go wrong. Automatic and vacuum advanced specifications are all spelled out in this reference book table. I'm sure you'll want to look them over. Don't worry, Pete. I won't make a move without taking a look at this book. a boy, Owen. And that's the best way to keep on top of this new engine's tune-up requirements. After all, we'll be delivering a lot of cars with this new inclined engine. How well it really pleases customers, though, depends a lot on the service we give it. <laughs>